invitation to me to uh, speak, a much appreciated uh, opportunity. Um, I intend, I think I've been allocated 30 minutes, I intend to be uh, a little bit more succinct than that and also to keep this as jargon free as possible. Um, so I may not even mention any games, I'll leave that to others for, for later on in the uh, those presentations. But essentially, um, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Chris Rivett, I am the Managing Director of Final Third Sports Media. Uh, a company that I set up in 2005. I uh, first worked in sports uh, at Northampton Town when uh, when they had a website in 2001. I worked at the Cobbers for a couple of years at Luton Town and then took the opportunity to set up my own business in 2005. So we pretty much work in uh, a different field for, for every one of our clients. Everyone comes to us with a, a different challenge, but it's generally around marketing, media communications, content branding. So Essentially, I'll always sort of say to people, if it involves uh, a solution that needs words and sport, then we can probably help you. So that's uh, an opportunity that kind of gets me into a lot of conversations. And certainly, uh, you know, we've been involved in some great projects around the world where we've, we've been able to have a real impact. And one of those is a work in progress at the moment in South Bend in Indiana. Uh, myself and Richie Jan, who is the owner of Ketchum Town, um, we're in a conversation and an opportunity there to, uh, to get involved in, in esports. So with everything that's happened with the pandemic, we're not where we want to be at this moment in time, but uh, we've, we've certainly been building towards what will be uh, effectively a, a 2021 start for us now. So I'll talk more about that later on um, and also set the scene, hopefully, for why I believe there's a huge opportunity for, for Northampton and, and Northamptonshire to probably replicate something very similar. Um, so without further ado, um, eSports, what is it? I imagine most people on the uh, presentation today will have a, a different interpretation of it. Certainly, if it's something you Google, you'll get a different uh, response from various websites and various people who might comment on it. For me, growing up, eSports was sensible soccer and player of the year. So I'm certainly still to be convinced there's a better game out there than sensible soccer, but I know I'm in the minority with, with that thought, the way that the world has kind of evolved. Um, modern day uh, interpretation of, of what eSports is, is largely centered around sort of three main areas. So we're talking multiplayer online battle arenas, which you'll, you'll see often referred to as MOBA, first person shooter games, and then essentially simulated sport. And a big area around that is uh, racing games predominantly, but every sport you can imagine can be simulated now. So that's another growing area of kind of esports. Essentially, esports is, is largely regarded as anything that's played competitively. So uh, these tend to be um, more team-sided games now at a professional level rather than one-on-one -on -one play, although it's really kind of anything from, from one to 11, uh, essentially with the size of, of most of teams for these sort of things. Twitch is up on the screen now. Um, Twitch is essentially, for those that aren't familiar with it, the kind of YouTube for streaming games. Um, there, there's different sort of uh, opportunities out there from a streaming platform point of view. Um, YouTube is obviously one, Facebook gaming, up until recently, Microsoft Mixer. So all different platforms you, you may have heard of, but Twitch is, is largely regarded as the go-to for, for streaming. So um, it's uh, largely a platform for, well, I say a platform, it, it's, it's more than that now. It's become a community. It's become somewhere where people can kind of share their passion for gaming. And, and that's best emphasized, I think, by the fact that Amazon paid a billion pounds for it, I think, in about 2014. And um, it offers a number of channels now, which they refer to as just chatting. So as well as the, the gaming platforms that exist for the teams and for individuals to kind of share um, in, in their own community and, and build that up, they um, they have a number of sort of streaming partnerships um, with pretty much every major league sport in America you can think of, with UFC, um, the National Women's Soccer League, which was the first US league to come back to play, used Twitch to broadcast the, the whole tournament for an international audience. They've recently set up some partnerships with Arsenal, Real Madrid. I'm sure there'll be a lot more, obviously, with the links to Amazon and um, then recently showing Premier League games. I can see this being a, a real platform that um, goes far beyond gaming over the next few years, at least as far as Amazon's objectives. Um, but essentially, um, it, is, it is the home of streaming. And it's an area where Amazon will make their money through two, two sort of key opportunities for them. One of them being advertising, obviously, the other being subscriptions. So they've recently rebranded uh, their subscription channel to uh, Prime Gaming, 
and um, you know this is certainly an area to kind of watch for anyone that's not aware um, or wants to be more involved in it you know it's worth signing up for a Twitch account and just sort of seeing how things grow over the next little while just to give you an idea because um, we're going to talk about some some big numbers throughout this just to give you an idea there were 2.5 billion um, monthly view uh, well quarterly views um, on Twitch in quarter three of 2019 which is the, the biggest number that they've, they've reached um, fell off a little bit in quarter four a little bit more competition in, in that regard but certainly the last sizable published numbers they have is 2.5 billion hours watched um, across a quarter so big big numbers there for what people are doing on, on that platform um, in terms of actual esports and the the way that it's set up um, it's sometimes referred to as a bit of a wild west out there um, there's essentially the very top level professional leagues which are franchise leagues often set up by the, the game's publishers so they will operate a franchise league where um, some of the biggest esports teams in the world are, are buying in to be a part of that um, there are a number of unfranchised leagues as well and unfranchised um, essentially means just open tournaments so there will be certain requirements from a uh, skill level to compete in those and, and obviously they also pay for big prizes as well um, but largely you, you'll sort of see um, a lot of reference to franchise leagues being the, the number one in, in that particular gaming territory you're also seeing more and more rights holders in sport and, and the example on the screen there is, is MLS Major League Soccer um, they're, they're one of a number again of the, the US sports uh, leagues where they've set up um, esports competitions essentially for the same teams that compete in their traditional sports so uh, for the last couple of years um, MLS have run an esports e-MLS cup um, and held a tournament um, which uh, had a representative from each team competing that's in, in FIFA this year with um, everything that happened with COVID they actually sort of changed it and had a special tournament so they paired up one player from the traditional sports team from the first team alongside the, the club's esport and had a little mini tournament so um, again, one great example there where esports is able to be flexible and able to adjust to some of the challenges that have had a severe impact on traditional sports and things like this example here is from their uh, all-star game. So once a year, they'll, they'll have a pop-up arena like this and they'll put events on and um, you know pretty flexible around that, providing sort of immersive experiences and opportunities for people to kind of see what the future of esports looks like beyond uh, obviously having it as a, a mini sort of pop-up gaming arena as well. So huge opportunities around, um, you know, people are, are thinking on their thing around these things. And certainly I'm looking forward to hearing from Tony and Caroline later on with regards to how they're tackling things at the Saints and the Cobblers, because it's a huge opportunity here to kind of engage with a, a different audience with something like this and, and make it part of a match day experience, but also kind of a standalone uh, opportunity. Now, the numbers game, as I promised at the beginning, I want to sort of talk about the, the big numbers. Everyone talks about it as a billion dollar industry quite what does that mean um, these are top level numbers that I'm going to go through over the next little while we'll look at kind of audience growth on the next slide the slides after that I actually want to talk about the um, esports teams the very top esports teams in the world and some of their valuations so if people want to sort of drop some ideas in chat as what they think some of the very best esports teams in the world are worth in uh, the current day it'd be interesting to kind of reflect back on those in uh, for five minutes time Looking at audience growth, um, we touched on this, I think, in some of the build-up to the event and some of the promotional marketing material. It's largely regarded to be around 500 million audience at the moment. Now, the numbers will have, have had an impact with everything that's happened. That, that may be to their advantage at the moment with everything that's happening in the world because I'm sure there are a number of people that probably did dial into Twitch and, and looked at um, eSports for the first time just to get hold of, of some sport, something to watch or something to be a part of while we were first in sort of lockdown. But essentially we're looking there at uh, two numbers that, that make up that big number. So C is the number of casual um, viewers that um, we've got and E is the enthusiasts. So you can see there that they're, they're both growing quite rapidly and people are converting from being a casual fan into becoming an enthusiast. So um, this data, which is provided by Newzu, which is uh, a gaming analytics firm, they sell a, a lot of very, very detailed reports for uh, quite a bit of money, but they also do a lot of the light versions of those reports. So it's certainly worth Googling that if you want to get more and more information around this, about the demographics, the audiences, and um, you know, break, breakdowns from this. Um, but Newzu basically are predicting that we're I mean, looking at you know, 644 million viewers, uh, people, fans of the sport, um, in 2022 so from two years from now we're essentially looking to add probably another 145 million people to the game from where we are now so these are you know these are 
big, big numbers um, in this side and, and growing rapidly and, and exponentially in some cases. Very much like the valuations for um, some of the top teams. So looking here at um, top five, essentially, um, Immortals Gaming Club values by Forbes at £210 million. Pounds. Uh, dollars, apologies, in dollars. Um, FaZe Clan, um, another big popular uh, esports team, certainly very strong on social media. They're valued at 240 million. We're looking at Team Liquid, which is part owned by Magic Johnson, the NBA player of yesteryear, at 320 million. And then with a valuation of 400 million dollars, we have a, a tie at the moment based on Forbes' valuations between two teams there, Cloud9 and TSM. Um, so, you know, these are, these are big, big numbers. Um, just to give you some perspective on those, we'll look at how much they've grown in the last 12 months. So Cloud9's valuation has gone up by 90 million, TSM's by 150 million. Now, for context, Dallas Cowboys are valued the most valuable sports uh, team, sports brand in the world. They're valued at 5.5 billion. Second in that list is New York Yankees at 5 billion. And then third there is New York Knicks, which is $4.6 million. So whilst we're some way with these numbers from, um, you know, the very top sort of traditional sports teams in the world, those teams have been around for a number of years. Um, but just just because we're talking about top three there that covers uh, one representative from the NFL, um, baseball and, and NBA, the top NHL team is New York Rangers and they're valued at $1.65 billion. And then in the MLS, Atlanta United is, is the top uh, team there. They're valued at 500 million. So once you start to break it down a little bit, and I'm coming at this from a very North American um, angle, but once you start to break it down, we're not far off some of the valuations of MLS teams. And looking at um, 10 years ago, and I know 10 months ago is a long time, but looking at 10 years ago, when Michael Jordan first invested in the Charlotte Hornets, they were valued at 175 million. That franchise now, which is at the lower end of, of uh, the NBA, that franchise now is, is said to be worth $1.5 billion. So we can look at that. We can see potentially, and this is a different world, so we, we have to sort of bear that in mind, but we can see the scale of where sports were 10 years ago to, to where esports is sitting now. We can look at some of these. I mean, NRG is another team. I mentioned them purely because Shaquille O'Neal, another NBA player, a uh, friend of, of the chairman of Northampton Town, he was an investor there. So, you know, we're talking about um, players that are choosing um, Michael Jordan, obviously putting his money into a, a traditional sports team, but we're also looking at some, some very wealthy guys from the sports, um, as I watched it growing up, that are putting money into esports teams amongst a number of investments that they're making. We've also got current NFL, NBA players that are investing in um, minority stakes in, in MLS teams at the moment. I'm going to sort of stick it out there that I think, given the time that these guys spend, um, that they're going to look at this as a, a huge investment opportunity for them in the future. And maybe potentially some of our current stars of, of these sports will put money into esports as a preference over traditional sports uh, if the growth can be continued in these areas. So it's certainly really interesting. As I said, definitely go. Have a look at Newzoo. Um, lots of, of reports out there that um, give you a real feel for kind of where the industry is heading from them. Um, and um, obviously Forbes' valuations, again, is a, a comparable benchmark that we've got at the moment. Another point to make on this is, is just to kind of have a look at some of the social media activities from some of these esports teams and where they, where they currently sit against um, traditional sports teams. Um, I can tell you that one of those five teams there has a social media presence on Instagram in terms of followers that's greater than the Cowboys, uh, Yankees and, and Knicks put together. So, um, you know, there's a big, big shift there again that we can imagine is going to have the value that um, sponsors and brands will be looking at. And again, just to give you an idea in terms of the billion dollar industry that esports is, we're talking about 82% projected um, for what was expected to happen in sort of 2019 20. Around 82% of revenue would be from three main areas, which is advertising, sponsorship, and media rights. So that is driven by brands essentially. So, so they're putting in you know, significant sums of money into these, and, and that social media presence for some of these esports teams will, will carry a lot of growth, which particularly when you start to compare. Um, an esports audience to a traditional sports audience. So there's some, some big, big numbers there. Obviously, lots of other ways that these teams make money, merchandise, ticket sales is, is another big area as well, but the bulk of it is coming from brand spend at the moment. 
on a slightly smaller scale. I um, just want to give you an overview of, of South Bend, Indiana, which is where myself and Richie have got involved in a project over there. So South Bend is a city uh, in, in northern Indiana. Population is around 100,000 um, within the city. We have set up the, the South Bend Lions eSports team. We were hoping that we would be um, actually competing at this in a, in a different world. At the moment, we're not. So just to sort of give you the, the background to that now, um, it's a community like all others at the moment that just needs a little bit of hope and something to look forward to. So a lot of our work at the moment is really kind of happening in the background. We're, we're building the rosters. We made the decision that uh, as a community focused sort of esports team, we wanted to be present. So it's a case of starting sensibly, um, progressing positively for, for the team looking at really kind of two or three sports just to get it off the ground so we've got a good steering committee behind us we've, we've been talking to a number of gamers in the community open to really what the games are that they want to be involved with rather than us turning up and saying right we want to play this game and this game and then trying to build the rosters we're trying to sort of tap into that gaming community and, and build the teams there so um, that's kind of where we are um, we, we really made a lot of progress um, obviously with lockdown it's given us time that, that we probably weren't anticipating having so we have made some progress to, to kind of where we want to be we're building some momentum in the background and we've got a couple of stakeholder partnerships um, which I'm going to go and talk about in a second where we kind of want to align where they are with where we want to be and then we can start to do stuff in a, in a far more public world but certainly for us it, it's uh, it's an exciting opportunity in, in that city part of the reason for that excitement comes from the background which uh, you'll have seen on some of my slides. So um, what they've done um, is they've created the Bendix Arena, which um, is set up with the objective of being the premier esports facility in the Midwest. So we're talking about South Bend and Indiana being essentially two hours east of Chicago. So there's a huge opportunity there to uh, evolve this facility into something that can hold a number of tournaments. So it's part of what they call the um, Century Center in the city, which is a 100,000 square foot convention center. It's an old theater that's been converted, 600 seat venue. Um, they're putting in a land cafe, some practice rooms, and um, it will allow up to 6v6 play. So um, for, for most kind of esports that we're looking to be in or around, um, that's, that's really ideal size for us. It will give us somewhere that we can obviously have as, as our home and, and a practice venue as well. So that's really great. Um, the local university, Bethel, has set up a program very similar, as I'm sure that we're going to hear from Cameron and Scott about later on. But the local university there set up an esports program. So um, we're working very closely with them with regards to opportunities, how we work together to kind of market the arena as well. So very much a kind of a, a three partnerships there um, with the, the venue being part of what they call the venue parks and arts. So the city guys are really behind it as well. So um, with everything that's happened, the refurbishment there has, has taken uh, longer than would have normally been anticipated. So we're very much holding back on, on where we are at the moment, ready to then sort of move that forward, possibly towards the end of this year, more likely to be uh, into next year. Which leads me nicely on to Northampton and, and one of the conversations that, that Richard and I had, which started obviously um, this evolving into what it is, was essentially, you know, this is a, a city of 100,000. Northampton is a town, I think, at the last census of around 215,000. Um, obviously, probably a bigger population now. The actual metro area in or around South Bend, when you take into the fact it's northern Indiana and, and has... Uh, a metro that includes part of Michigan. When you look at that, it's 315,000. The county itself here is, is 750,000 people. So, you know, Northampton is, with all due respect, bigger than South Bend. And, and there is um, a lot of people doing a lot of good stuff, I think, in isolation, as I understand it, within, within Northampton. Obviously, the Cobblers have, have had a, a programme in place for a couple of years. The university have been building up towards that as well. I know the Saints have been planning some things here. Um, and I'm very fortunate with where I go around the world. Um, I'm always quite sceptical when, when I meet people and, and they sort of say, oh yeah, I, I know of Northampton, but they do actually know of Northampton. Um, when you get into the conversation, they know of it for, for three reasons. And the three reasons that we've always been very proud of as Northamptonians over the years, you know, the cricket club, um, the football club and the rugby team. People do know these teams. They do have a huge following um, and awareness of sport in, in England. And also you've got Silverstone as well. So when you're kind of into the motorsport territory of Indy, um, you know, people know where, where Northampton is. So we've got, you know, huge sporting success, huge pedigree that many counties in this country don't have. Um, it's a huge opportunity, I think, to add esports to that. You know, we've got a huge history as a, as a county that, 
and a town where we, we had significant sort of influence on government and it was the capital for a number of years the, the, the big question is going to kind of come out of today is is this an area where we could lead the country again you know is esports something that we could be looking at um i don't see anything from from my understanding of the industry and my understanding of the town that that should stop us at the moment if there's enough like-minded people that kind of want to come together so i'm excited for the rest of today's presentations where we're going to go um over the next little while what conversations will kind of follow on from that um i'm happy to obviously connect with a number of people that uh, i haven't previously spoken to you can follow me um through that handle on both twitter and twitch um i'm also on linkedin so you can find me on there you can get hold of me through final third as well so if anybody wants to reach out to me wants to kind of have a conversation away from today would love to obviously facilitate anything i can do with my contacts and particularly any introductions i can make with what we're doing in indiana that might be beneficial for people here um finally if anybody wants to download the slides you can download them from that address link we're just going to share that as well later on um but um feel free to sort of download those and, and reach out to me um after today's event i don't know if we've got time for some questions now or not richard but um i'll be around for the, the q a and the panel stuff later on yeah, that was um, great, Chris. Thanks very much for that. Really, um, really insightful things there. I guess we have got a couple of questions. Just one, one from me to start with. Even before yeah. lockdown, how much of it? How much of the esports world is virtual versus fixed physical events? So you've talked about your team in America. You've built um, like a conference center, a place for the games to play. How much of that happens in the sport normally, or how much of it is done virtually and just over the internet? I wouldn't know the exact split on that. I think it varies from where you are as, as how remote the place is. Obviously, you know, esports has always had this reputation as being kind of people in their basements and, and it's not that now, you know, it's just a huge, huge billion dollar industry. And uh, I think um, depending on where you are, you know, if you're in a big city with, with particularly when I talk about kind of North America and Asia, which are kind of the vast majority of, of where gaming comes from in terms of the professional level. I think when you've got access to some of the, the stadia that's there in some cases you know we, we, we see venues that are huge you know 25 30 thousand people turning up for events it, it's a number i still struggle to kind of get my head around but um you know at a low level like i think you'll see more of these kind of converted spaces that, that we're involved with over in the us that, that are happening um perhaps popping up in or around here it's, it's a great opportunity for perhaps a you know a rundown theater or, or something that needs a new lease of life um you know there's a, there's a cost to converting these and, and certainly the infrastructure from a technology point of view is not cheap, but there is, um, you know, opportunities in, in, in venues. So I'd have to research to give you the exact answer on that, but I think it will depend, you know, the, the further out, the more rural you are, the, the less likelihood you are going to be able to get to an event without having to get in the car and traveling for a few hours. Yeah. Okay. That's great. And then just one of the, we'll save these up for, um, for the panel at the end, but Matthew's asked, he works at um, N sports uh, within the County council. He's, um, He's asked around, where do you see esports in supporting physical activity levels for participants? Yeah, great question. Um, when, when you drill down into the structure of some of these professional teams, and ultimately there's no reason why this shouldn't be replicated anywhere um, other than subject to budget, but it can be scaled down accordingly. But when you look at some of these professional teams, the, the, the makeup of their front office and, and support staff is, is phenomenal. And strength and conditioning is a huge, huge part of that. You, know, you, you cannot sit in front of a screen None of us can for a number of hours. So they, these guys need that. And then particularly, um, you know, with the gaming chairs and all the technology that's there to try and make them feel comfortable, almost to try and keep you in that chair and playing these games. Um, you know, people need to sort of get out there. So there's there's investment certainly in, in strength and conditioning out there. And as much from a mental point of view and um, a lot of these reactionary games and things like that, just to keep you on your toes and just keep you stimulated in a different way that gets you away from screen. So I think if anybody is seriously looking to do something in, in that sort of environment, you, you have got to think about people's mental well-being as well as their, their physical one as well. So, um, you know, there's, there's never been greater awareness of, of those two, I don't think, than, than what's happening in the world at the moment. And I think it's naturally going to follow through that people are going to be looking to build that as a key part of the program as well. Yeah, that's great. I think we'll end it there, Chris, and then you're going to come back um, at the end for the, the panel discussion as well. So brilliant. I'll stop the record there. Thanks very much. Sure. Thank you.